um, uh, Yaqub ibn Yisak al kinde that was his full name, uh, who was an uh, Arab philosopher whom I've studied. And don't get me wrong, while I'm talking about all this, I want you to keep in mind that yes, I study Arabic. I think it's a very, very beautiful language, very poetic. It has a lot of insights in it, a lot of uh, uh, meaning and stuff in it. But in, if you really, really get into the study of it over and above uh, uh, just the ability to be able to speak or read and write, you'll see that there are many, many subtle meanings for virtually every word in the Quran. Of course, we have all the diacritical marks, and we'll talk about that a little later on. In the earliest versions of, the, of Arabic, there are no diacritical marks. So any of these particular letters could mean any of a number of things, as many in some cases as 30 different meanings. And so you need to think about that before we start going into looking at the translations. But anyway, Al-Kindi, who is one of my favorites, by the way, uh, in terms of uh, 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 Arab philosophers, uh, replied to a Muslim opponent on the subject of the uniqueness of the Quran, and it's pronounced Quran, not Koran, uh, that he actually held in his hand a compilation of the revelations of Musaylima bin Habib, whose name is up there. Musaylima bin Habib was one of the several men who claimed to be a prophet during the time of Muhammad. This is very, very important. There were lots of other people who were pushing the idea of being a prophet. And, 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 and of course, through a bunch of ruses and stuff, as we see later on, because uh, at the battle that they called the Battle of Your Mama, uh, 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 <laughs> the Battle of Your Mama. Not my mama, not your mama, but your mama, all right? Uh, <laughs> I didn't even think y'all get a kick out of that. I, I, that, that. That totally went past me. I never you know, was even looking at it like that. <laughs> but anyway. His name was Musaylima, right? And Musaylima was a prophet simultaneous with Muhammad, who was executed by the uh, military leader Khalid ibn uh, al-Walid during a military expedition ordered by the first caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr, after the death of the prophet. Now, this is very, very important. Musaylima was very, very, very powerful. And see, in a situation like that, everybody can't be a prophet. They can only be one, all right? They can only be one. So. Justification of early Muslim uh, e of equation of blackness with servitude was found in the Genesis story popularly called the Curse of Ham in reference to one of Noah's sons. And this story found its way into Arab Muslim historiography and ethnology in a somewhat distorted manner that reflected the rise of racism in the new empire, talking about the, 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 the caliphate as it were. Most significantly, significantly in this regard is the work of Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Kisai in his book, The Tale of the Prophets. Uh, and in this collection of mythological narratives is based on prophetic reports or hadith, we're gonna look at that word a little bit later on, of various levels of our authenticity, and on Arabian and Hebrew folklore, which elaborates on the stories of the prophet mentioned in passing in the Quran. Now, al-Kisai's book is really uh, a collection of mythologies based largely on the narrations of two converts from the Hebrew faith who are Abdullah ibn Salam and Kab al-Akbar. And they provided the link to the biblical tale of Noah, his sons, and the curse of Ham entering into the collectivity of Muslim thought and doctrine. And as the empire grew, that is the caliphate, uh, began to grow, so did the resentment for those of African descent in Arab society. And before and during the life of the prophet, the Habashi, or the Abyssinians, that's what that place used to be called before it was called Ethiopia, uh, of relatively recent uh, 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 history, and of course it had to do with some things that happened with a, a French, actually, actually a French Egyptologist and his relationship with the late Haile Selassie, Haile Selassie I Rastafari. All right, um, and the prophet even sent a caravan of his followers to Abyssinia for, re for refuge from the persecution. And after the city of Harar, uh, which was later included in the Sultanate of Adal, uh, in Abyssinia fell to the Muslims, the role of empire was subject to being reversed. And so within 100 years of the empire, the Muslim elite became increasingly arrogant and exclusivist toward non-Muslims and Arab races. Poetry and proverbs became more common, eventually made their way into the social doctrine of the Muslim society to justify and legitimize religiously the idea that blacks and slaves were interchangeable words. Now, one of the most significant things, and I want to show him first, Uthman Amir Ibn Baha al-Jahiz, who wrote a book called The Glory of the Black. Blacks, you can pick it up, too. It's, it's actually, I think, being pushed by Black Classics Press right now. You can get it. All right, now, he's a, this is a brother, very interesting brother, who wrote, uh, um, uh, stated that the blacks have said to the Arabs, from your ignorance, talking about the Arabs, 
You consider us as belonging to you as you consider your women, that is, your property, in the period of ignorance. We're going to talk about this thing called the period of ignorance that they refer to as jahalia from the word jahal, which means ignorant. Uh, when the justice of Islam came, you saw that this was an evil attitude, yet we have no desire to desert you. In other words, we know that you all think of us this way, but we don't want to let y'all go. All right? Um, yet most African Muslims, however, rejected their black heritage altogether and adopted the seemingly superior Arab customs and attitudes characterized in Arab Islamic tradition. Because what happened, the period that they call Jahaliyat, Jahaliyat is a period of time, what they call the period of ignorance. The period of ignorance is the time prior to the Hijra in 622 when Muhammad made his trek from Mecca to Medina. In other words, their argument is that prior to that time, there is no history, no pyramids. No medu nature, no nothing until this period of time. Even though one of the significant words I have up here, the word uh, umiya. Umiya means one who is incapable of reading and writing, and it's an epithet that was often applied to Muhammad as one who was ignorant. All right, the word umiya. All right, uh, so it says that. Uh, uh, in so doing, they neglected their own uh, wisdom traditions, deeming their history to be that of a cursed people. And African Muslims sought to distance themselves from their pre-Islamic heritage by drawing sharp distinctions between themselves and their non-Muslim fellow Africans. All right. He further went on to say that uh, we have like conquered the country of the Arabs as far as Mecca and have governed them. We defeated Dua Nawaz, uh, the, the king who was uh, what they call the Jewish king in Yemen, and killed all the Himyarite princes. But you, white people, have never conquered our country. And this is what he's saying back then. But yet we had a reverse today. So, you know, we have to look at what's wrong with that. Our people, the Zans, revolted 40 times in the Euphrates, driving the inhabitants from their homes and making Obala uh, a bath of blood. And that blacks are physically stronger than no matter what other people. A single one of them can lift stones of greater weight and carry burdens such as several whites could not lift nor carry between them. They are brave, strong, and generous as witness their nobility and general lack of wickedness, even though later on we'll see uh, some things very, very different. Now that's Al Jahiz. Now let's go to somebody right here like uh, the famous uh, um, Ibn Khaldun, right, who wrote the book called the al Muhadima, right, the, the, the famous al Muhadima. He said, and then he added that blacks are the only humans who are closer to dumb animals than the rational beings. They have great levity, excitability, and great emotionalism, which is due to the expansion and diffusion of the animal spirit in them. All right. Then we go to Nasr al-Din Tusi, right, who was a famous Iranian uh, philosopher on his particular study of the image of blacks in Persian literature. He says, in various kinds of, various kinds, if various kinds of men are taken in one place after another, like the Negro of Zanzibar in the south and southmost countries, the Negro does not differ from the animal in anything except the fact that his hands have been lifted from the earth, except for what God wishes. Many have, been, have, have seen that the ape is more capable of being trained than the Negro and more intelligent, all right? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, yeah. That was that was just in the literature. But we're gonna get to that in a minute with that word. Okay. Right. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. All right. So Saad Al Andalusi, uh, he was an Arab thinker from southern Spain who wrote that blacks are more like animals than men, and that the rule of virtuous stability and judgment is lacking among them. Such noble qualities being replaced by foolishness and ignorance. Then we have. Ahmed bin Hanbal, and he reported a saying attributed to the prophet, which in effect states that God created the white race, the Duhuria Baida, from the right shoulder of Adam and created the black race, Duhuria Sawada, from the Adam's left shoulder, and those of Adam's right shoulder would enter paradise, and those of the left shoulder would go into perdition. So you see where we were going. All right. Uh, our uh, Abisha. Uh, Abshibi in the 14th century uh, was, mentions how he, an overwhelming number of enslaved Africans led, uh, led to prejudice against African people and in the works of the several Arab, uh, Arabic historians and geographers. And for example, this is what all uh, Abshibi wrote. It is said that when the African slave is sated, he fornicates and when he is hungry, he steals. All right, so 
Here we have many 